Well, I want to wish you a hello. I would like to say good morning, good night, good evening. I'm not sure when you'll be watching or listening. I don't know if it'll be a podcast or maybe you've received a SLU email and you've clicked on to several different uh, tools that we're hoping to make available to you. But I want you to know I'm Jay Strack and privileged to be the founder and president of Student Leadership University. And we also have a podcast that we make available to businessmen, to parents, business ladies, educators, ministers, and uh, we've been blown away, some 40,000 downloads. So we're very excited. But I want to give a personal emphasis for all of us who have children, grandchildren, whether we're parents, uh, whether we're uh, youth pastors, youth workers, pastors, whether we're Christian educators, and by the way, thank God for every one of you. You are the front line responders. You are the first responders uh, when it comes to protecting your children. And SLU is honored and privileged to tag team with churches and Christian organizations, First Priority and Young Life and FCA. We're so grateful for churches that trust us with their students and also so many Christian schools. So whether you're a student or whether you're one of those whose job is to guide and protect and, and mentor young people, then this is a time for us to, as we get ready to go back to school, a heart-to-heart -heart talk. I want to talk to you about some of the challenges going on. I've been speaking for a long time. I'm an old dude, but I know what you're thinking. Incredibly cool. And I, I, I just say that because it's, it's true. But I want you to know that in all seriousness, I've been speaking for almost uh, 50 years to students. There's a battle for your mind. There's a battle for your body. There's a battle for your soul. There's a battle for your family and your future. And all of that is found in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. It says, you know, be sober, be vigilant. In the original grammatical construction, that means, man, be mentally alert, the sober. Be careful what affects your thoughts and your will. Be careful for the battle for your mind, thoughts, sites you go to, uh, who you hang out with, language, pornography. I mean, there's a hundred alcohol and drugs, mind and mood altering drugs. So there's be mentally alert. But when you see them together, be sober, be vigilant. It's literally translated, be mentally alert, be morally alert. Because if you lose the battle for your mind, that's why guys are always trying to get young ladies to have a drink. It's not because they want you to have a good time. It's because they, they're hoping they'll have a good time at your expense. So just know you your choices you make are going to seal your fate. And parents, our job is to also know as we pray and advise, and that's what the, hopefully this uh, both podcast or uh, newsletter is going to be a resource because we're going to deal with racial tensions, with a fascinating uh, video podcast we did on the two letters that were written uh, by, uh, the, by two guys that are like brothers to each other, two of our key leaders at Student Leadership, Dr. Brent Crow, and soon to be, uh, he's about to finish his dissertation and defend it, uh, Jeffrey Wallace. Uh, and I, they're going to talk. One is uh, obviously a, a white redneck, and the other one is an African American leader. But letters to their sons, what they had to write, put in words to help their sons go through some of the stuff that you may be encountering, our students will be encountering at school. That's a great resource. We're also, I'm going to talk about all the gender. Uh, stuff going on and all the pressure for everybody to fit in and and agree with everything, no matter what the Bible says or what our biblical worldview is. So I'll deal with that in a moment. But also we're going to talk about, I hope you're ready for this, social media. And that's why I've asked Taylor Glow, a remarkable young lady uh, in every sense of the word. I don't want to embarrass her here. I've known her longer than either one of us want to admit. But uh, I've watched her grow into a beautiful teenage girl. I've watched her grow into being active in her youth group. I've seen her with her family, uh, been privileged to know her family quite well, her youth group, her church, very involved, became a leader in her youth group, was a leader in college. And then 
uh, we were privileged to have her come through student leadership. And by the time we were finished, she, this young lady, we're going, we need her to come back. And so we've tried to take her every summer and she's made a commitment. I don't know, you don't know this yet, Taylor, yeah. but for the next 10 years, every summer. But uh, anyway, <laughs> this is who you want mentoring your daughter. Uh, I can just tell you as the father of two girls, and I've got a grandson. This is the this is a young lady that is lived living her faith. But I also know this is a young lady that knows the pressures that our young people are going to go through. So rather than me give you some stats and statistics, I wanted you to hear from someone very close to the age. She's now, like I said, moving on to speak to uh, and, and be ministering and working with uh, college girls and college, I guess students are just young ladies. Just students. All just students. students. Yeah. All right. Well, okay then. So uh, everyone. Uh, yeah, everyone. <laughs> All right. So Taylor, I'm putting you on the spot here as the world's greatest expert on navigating okay. social media, but we know and our parents know and, and you know what these young people and some of our that are going to learn a lot in this broadcast what their children or grandchildren actually our children in their classroom are being exposed to yeah and how do we navigate the saturation you and i were talking earlier and and you reference saturation several several times so what does that mean to you navigating social media and then what keeps coming out of you about saturation help us with that yeah, I think first realizing that this generation that we're in that's coming up, so teenagers, uh, people in college, young adults, um, this is a first generation that's come up with, they've had social media since their adolescence. And so uh, there's people who are students who are in middle school and high school who've obviously had it a lot longer. But for myself, um, I've had it since I was 13 years old. And I think just number one, us coming into this conversation of recognizing that's where a lot of students are at, which I feel like that's a known thing. But when you kind of put it in your head of these students have really been on not just Facebook, but Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok, they've had those things just a part of their lives and a constant access. I think that that can help one put things in perspective of how much more is able to get to them and how much more they are able to see, um, whether it's good or bad. And so that is something that I always try to start with when having this conversation of, when we're actually able to recognize that people who were born in 1995 or on um, have really just grown up in a social media saturated world that has really shaped their whole just adulthood or going into adulthood and so that has shaped their worldview that has shaped their friends that has shaped their interactions um and just at school at church at whatever it is and so number one with that being said it really also shapes just how they've grown up meaning they're growing up a lot faster and they're dealing with things that are I couldn't even imagine, even though I was one of the ones that is at the top of this next generation that has had social media from an early age. There are girls that I'll be talking to now who are dealing with things that I didn't deal with until I was in college or that I didn't even understand or know about until I was in college. And so it's, it's eye opening. It's scary. It is sad. Um, and it's just something that we also have to recognize as just the more we go in this world and the more that time goes on with this, with social media just being a thing and it's not gonna go away as much as people talk about it. It's, there will always be some form of this of just having access to everything. Hmm. Then we have to recognize that we have to equip students in a way that they are prepared for it and they're actually able to interpret it and they're actually able to um, have a biblical worldview with so many worldviews at their fingertips. They're actually able to make decisions with so many people telling them what decisions to make at their fingertips and just knowing the back and forth. And secondly, so first it's just recognizing how you teach them. But then secondly, going into this conversation of just recognizing that um, they're coming from a completely different perspective. 
um, all these students who are coming up at this point, uh, they, like I said, they know a lot and they know a lot way ahead of what we knew uh, growing up. And so they're coming from the perspective of, I, I just want truth. I want what's real and that's what I need and that's what I crave. And I think that that is a really cool thing. Um, I think if you think of it as it's sad because they're seeing so many things all the time and they're, they have constant access to things. But on the other hand, I think that that has caused this need and this hope and this craving for truth um, because they've heard so many different views. They hear so many different opinions. And so it's at the point of, I want you to be authentic. I want you to be truthful. I need to know what's actually true and actually factual because I'm hearing a lot of different things. And so I think that that gives us as believers, that gives us as a church, that gives us as people who minister to students or who are parents to students, the opportunity to teach what absolute truth looks like and also the opportunity to show in scripture how we know what's truthful and how we know it's not. And it's just knowing scripture and knowing who Jesus is and having that relationship. So those are the two first things that I just think is important to note as we're going to this just conversation about social media. Taylor, the couple statements, and then I just want you to respond, you know, because a lot of times some of us that really care a great deal about students and some of us that knew the scene, we were in the middle of everything. And now all of a sudden there's a whole list of issues yeah. that we've never even thought about. I mean, you know, so uh, as someone who's navigating that yourself, what is a uh, some guideline. What is a, is a governor? You know, there's a governor on the car that keeps the car from overheating. Uh, there's a governor on the car to keep it from, you know, keep things in the middle of the road, keep it balanced. Yeah. What is a governor that we can put on? What, if you're talking to the young ladies, young men, what's a governor that you, what, what are a couple things you yeah. do to say, you know, I want to be a certain kind of uh, young man, young lady, you know, I want to be a certain kind of leader. I want to represent well, and I want the abundant life. I want the, the full life, the blessings of God, yeah. but I also want to uh, help my friends, you know, so, right. and stay connected. And so yeah. what, what do you do? How do you balance some of that? Three things come to mind. Um, and I'm speaking about these three things from personal experience. Again, I grew up in the social media age, whatever you want to call it. Um, so I'm going to come at it from those, from what I know I learned and what I know helped me. Uh, whereas, but I just want to emphasize that even how I grew up is completely different than how even other students, younger students who are in my generation are growing up. But I think that these three things can still apply. So this is from personal experience um, that I just think will help. It's first a guideline. It'll really help us think about um, the time that's spent on social media. So we hear that all the time. I feel like students hear that a lot of, well, you're spending a lot of time on social media. You're constantly on social media. It's just a part of your everyday. And I think if we change that phrasing and if we change that perspective, it really helps. And that's, this is a thing that helped me was when I started thinking of being on social media or whatever it may be, or being online on the internet is not just time that was spent, but rather moments that were lost. It really just changed my perspective. Uh, whereas I, cause I can spend a lot of time on things on whether it be social media or whether it be homework. Um, I can spend a lot of times on things, but when I actually think of it as moments that are lost, of interactions that are lost, of people I could have been talking to, of a phone call that I could have had, or a dinner that I could have been at, or um, a helpful podcast that I could have been listening to, or scripture that I could have been reading, when I'm thinking of it as moments and opportunities that I lost rather than time that was just spent, that is first, I think, a good foundation to then kind of start on is number one. Let's go. Uh, thanks. Uh, but two, I think when you start there, then you're able to kind of personalize it. When you're able to personalize social media and not just think of it as a platform or an app or whatever it may be, you're actually able to personalize it and think of it as 
honestly, when I'm on social media, I'm sometimes it could feel like I'm going to coffee with 17 different people at the same time, because I might be answering their DMs or just commenting on things or liking people's pictures when you're, so that's a lot of just mm -hmm. saturate and stimulation, I think. Um, that's a little bit of an overstimulation sometimes. And when you're actually able to personalize it of, if I think about when I'm getting online, I could be talking to a lot of different people at the same time. I could be um, interacting with a lot of, seeing a lot of different things. That's a lot of overstimulation. And that's a lot of just, whether you're extrovert or introvert, that's a lot of people at once. And so I truly believe that we are human, we as human beings are not meant to be this overstimulated. Um, we mm -hmm. have access to everything that we could want, um, other than like Pentagon secrets, which Dr. J, honestly, knowing your background, I don't know, who knows, I wouldn't be surprised if you knew some of those, but um, we have access to everything that we could want. And so when we're actually able to personalize social media and make it seem more like a human being in the sense of that's a lot of people at once that also changes the perspective of things and um do i need to be talking to this many people at one time or can i be investing in actual meaningful real relationships which i don't want to take away that you can't also do that on social media but i think just trying to regulate how much you do that is really important and then thirdly i'll say the last thing that really helped me when i finally realized this um, and things that I tell uh, middle school girls and students now of just, we are called to be different. And I think it's a simple thing that students hear a lot and all the time, and they'll, you know, in youth group or they'll read it on social media, they'll read it wherever, but we are called to be different. And we don't wanna just merge into everyone else. And everybody wants to be the hero. Everybody wants to be different. So, but number one, take that, longing take that need to be different and make it to where we're actually doing it for the right reason so we're called to be different in christ um, but when we realize that um it's then okay do i really need to constantly be on social media do i need to be doing this at this time what if i was different and maybe didn't have snapchat right now what if i was different and maybe didn't have instagram or TikTok right now what if I was actually able to be like, I don't have this right now because this is not helping me. And it's just you as a student or you as a parent, whichever um, as you're listening as, of uh, whether you as a parent deciding for your student or your child or you as a student deciding for yourself, maybe I don't need this right now. It's not helping me. It's draining me. I feel more lonely. I feel more depressed like after being on this platform. Um, so just understanding and accepting that it's okay to be different. It's not, it's okay to have all of these things and, or to not have these things. Um, it reminds me of a story. So when I was 13, 14, I was one of the last in my class to get a cell phone. And so I was, and I remember just always begging my parents, please, please. I just, Everybody in my class has a cell phone. Everybody has one. Why am I always the last to, you know, do this? Always the last to do this because I hadn't dated anyone. I hadn't done all of these things. And so I was just like, oh my goodness. And I remember it was me and just one other person in my class who didn't have a cell phone at that point. And I just remember being like, of course it's me and this person. Like, obviously they don't have a cell phone because, you know, they might be a little awkward or just not, you know, socially. But I was just like, obviously they don't have a cell phone. And of course it's me and so-and-so. And I'm always the last to do this. And I just had a lot of self-pity for myself. And one day I just was, I, I don't know, I think we're at dinner or something. And I t looked at my parents and I was like, can I just not be different this one time? Like, can I just not be different? Can I just get a cell phone and not be the last one to do whatever it may be? And I thought this is a great like argument. I was like, I'm different on everything else. Like I have different, I don't go to the parties. I don't go to certain friends' houses because I know it will end up in not good situ situations. I don't date, like I'm, I'm fine with that. And I'm already so different on all of these levels. So why can't I just get a phone? Mm -hmm. um, and my, I'll never forget what my dad said. He was like, okay, Taylor, you saying that already shows me that that's not the mindset that you need to be in to get a phone. He goes, when you start to think of it as, oh, well, I'm already different on so many levels, then honestly, that's like, you would be making a compromise. Like, oh, well I can do, if I'm already different on this, then I can just get this and it'd be fine. 
And he was like, and when you start making compromises like that more and more, then that's going to turn into a bigger issue down the road. And he goes, so we could easily get you a phone. It's not that we don't trust you. It's not that we don't think that you need a phone or whatever it may be, but I want you to decide for yourself when you're actually ready now, like you understanding my heart and where I'm coming from and your mom and I's heart, that you need to look at it not as I just want a phone because everybody else has it, but do you really need a phone? Is this something that is good for you at this time? Or are you just going to be making a compromise because everybody else has it? And I think we can apply, even though that was a phone, I think we can apply that to social media for students nowadays of, do you just get social media because everybody has it? Or, and do you just interact on social media because everybody has these apps and platforms? Are you actually taking a moment for yourself and thinking for yourself, do I need this right now? Is this something that is helping me? Is this something that's helping my relationship with the Lord, helping my relationship with friends, helping my relationship with my siblings? Is this something that is helping or hindering? And thinking of it that way of just, we are called to be different. And so you need to begin to think for yourself and not just group think things because everybody else is getting, Mm. or everybody else has these platforms. All right, Taylor, I'm gonna give you a couple statements that those of us that have lived a while, you know how, Preachers are, I yeah. is one, you know, dads are, you know, yes. you, got, you got a dad who's a man's man. You imagine some young guy coming over and wanting to ask permission for something that, you know, <laughs> you know. So, but anyway, in all seriousness, I want to just give you a couple statements and I just want you to respond. Okay. I mean, what, how, how does, what's a better way to say it or how to, res, you know, all right. Number one, uh, I really do see how young people feel left out of Mm -hmm. all that's going on. So how do you, in your own heart, I love what the advice your dad gave, and I appreciate you being very candid about you had to kind of work through all that yourself. But what is that about being left out? I mean, that is the toughest part for me as a teen, Mm -hmm. was for me as a teenager. Uh, I just wanted to fit in, for lack of a better word. I didn't want to be the coolest. I didn't want to be the, you know, I just didn't want to be left out. And I had a lot of things going on in my life, family-wise and all that stuff that was falling apart. So I didn't have a lot at home, number one, but I still had that strong desire to belong. Yeah, I think, I mean, and that's true for everyone. I, I feel like no matter what generation, you're going to feel that. And so for this specific generation, just of feeling that since they're able to have access and see exactly what everybody's doing at whatever time, I think that has also amplified it as well. And so my response to that is just um, understanding that social media is not always what it portrays itself to be. It's not always a perfect life. It's not always that, you know, you could be looking at someone's vacation and didn't know that I don't know, their friend or their um, flight got canceled and it was a horrible get there. But then you're like, man, they're in Hawaii. That's amazing. But maybe they're having a terrible time. I don't know, whatever it may be of just looking at social media and looking at it from a perspective of it's not always just what it portrays to be. Um, But with the whole feeling left out and lonely, I mean, it is true. And you can pretty much look at any research on social media right now. And I know that Netflix's um, Social Dilemma uh, documentary that they did last year, it even hit on that. And that this wasn't even um, a biblical or Christian documentary, but they talked about it too, of just how this generation is um, the loneliest and they are the most depressed and they actively deal with mental health. And it's getting younger and younger of an age where it's becoming more and more common. And so I think one of the things that we need to recognize as parents and as leaders to students on the whole feeling left out is that it's even more so amplified because they're able to see um, what their friends are doing at all times and what they are not doing and recognizing that even more so. Um, and so when we as ministers and parents recognize that we're able to come at it from a perspective of, we get what it's like to feel left out, but they're feeling it, you know, sometimes 20 times more because they're seeing 20 more of their friends and parties that they weren't invited to at that time or right. whatever it may be. Um, and just responding in that way. That's excellent. Now, an, a statement that I like to share, trying to do my best to 
prepare, you know, the future belongs, you've heard this a million times, say, your future, the future belongs to those that are prepared. Yeah. And our job is to prepare. And the word prepare means to be pointed in the right direction, to be made complete. And I believe that's by faith in the Lord and he moves into our heart, that emptiness, that God-shaped yeah. vacuum is filled. So he makes us complete. We need to be pointed in the right direction. And number three, we got to be equipped for battle. Mm. So one of the things I'm, I'm trying to share, but I, I don't want to be the, the guy, the old guy on the porch either, you know, with young people, stay off of the grass, you know, but <laughs> simply, simply put that, uh, you know, don't ever send a photo that to anybody that you don't want the whole universe to see. No and realize every single thing you post on Instagram, it's there forever. Everything you say angry with somebody, every photo you put on, everything you recommend, all of that is there, no matter what anybody tells you, forever. And let's just be candid. Schools, whether or not you get admitted, yep. uh, scholarships, internships, uh, jobs, people have a right to know who they're. And so guess what? Yeah. It's not an invasion of privacy for them to look at what you've put out for the whole world to see. Yeah. And it's kind of hard to walk in. You got good grades and you got an impressive CV or resume, but guess what? Man, this girl parties a lot. This girl, get man, she has said some ugly things. And by the way, how many times do you say some immature as a young person about someone else. And then we're hearing about it today. People are losing uh, opportunities yeah. to serve because they oh, said yeah. something in the 11th grade about somebody that yeah. was, that frankly was uh, inappropriate. Mm -hmm. And so I just, when when I make statements like that, I wanna make sure I'm not coming across as that yeah. that guy, you know, does that, does that resonate? No, it does, it's so true. and. I, what you just said about people not being able to serve or people, whoever, if they have some sort of platform, um, I've seen it on multiple occasions, just of something on Twitter that they said 10 years ago um, is brought up and they lose their position. And so recognizing that, um, and I think students need to hear that and need to know it because one of the things with growing up with social media is it becomes less of a big deal and it becomes more normal. And so when you have that less of a responsibility feeling and it feels more common, then you get more comfortable on it and you feel more okay with sharing. And, you know, even though you feel like you're still choosing what you're sharing, you might just share a lot more than you would normally would. And so when that comfortableness and just like feeling okay with it and just letting your guard down of, um, and just feeling that like you can say whatever it is and it's not gonna have a consequence, just, no, that's not true. And so understanding that there are consequences with everything, just as if you make a decision um, to do something uh, just in person as an action is the exact same thing when you get on social media, that is still an action. And that's still a decision that you are making of posting something. And so we always know that our decisions and our actions have consequences. Um, but I think sometimes it's taken less into uh, perspective or people think of it less when they're online because it doesn't feel like we're actually doing an action towards someone. Um, but it's just an online thing. So it's, you know, it's casual, it's normal, but still recognizing that no, that is an action and that will have consequences and that could ruin a career that could ruin a family that could ruin a whatever it may be. And um, I mean, scripture says it best of uh, what comes out of the heart, it comes out of your mouth. And um First off, so let's just start with it being a hard issue, if we're just going to get real, of understanding or recognizing that um, whatever you're posting, still that reflects who you are, and that reflects your heart and what you believe. There's a great verse, thank you, that was very insightful. Uh, there's a great verse called the Great Commission, <laughs> and it says, go into all the world and tell all your friends, tell everybody the good news of Jesus, right? Yeah. And and follow and, and encourage them to follow him and be baptized and grow and disciple, you know, and be mentored and be in a church. So there's that great commission. Yeah. But that little phrase, it literally says, as you go, 
So as I go into the 11th grade, as I go into the 12th grade, as I'm wow. about, to, about to leave home and go off to college, yeah. as I go, and then I use that little phrase, uh, you know, I'm a sports guy, most guys, and a lot of girls as well, but you know, I, I want to know every, I want to know what's, what's going on with the Cowboys. I want to know what's going on with the Yankees. Yes. I want to know what's going on with the Florida Gators. I want to know about WWE. I mean, you know, I'm an intellectual, but <laughs> and I, and I want the teams that I know are near to the Lord's heart. But I, I just want to, but as I go, if I'm not careful, there'll be 20 ads that pop up. Yeah. There'll be 20 related articles. You know, you look up your favorite college team, and then there's something about the the party school. What are the top five party schools? Or, you know, who are the hottest cheerleaders? Or who's got the best looking guy? I mean, you know, I mean, yeah. and it's amazing to me that just going to get a, a score, just to go, well, a sports score, that is, but to, to go somewhere and to just keep up with your team and what all's going on. Uh, as you go, there's going to be a lot of stuff out there. And, and there's a great saying by General Schwarzkopf, the great hero of Operation Desert Storm a long time ago. And I am privileged to have met him. But General Schwarzkopf says something I'll never forget. The easiest way to be defeated, and he's talking about in war, is to be distracted. Mm. Well, if that's true, when the consequences are high, and we're talking about a war, mm. but guess what? You becoming the young man and, and getting God's will for your life, that becoming the young lady and experiencing God's best and God's fullest for your life, the easiest way to be defeated is to be distracted. And every time yeah. there's that vibration, now guys usually put their phone in their front pocket. Young ladies will put it in their purse or their back. I mean, but when, wherever it may be, wherever that vibration is, that controls our life. Yeah. And worrying about missing out or being the last to know or not commenting on what 900 people have already commented on. Right. You know, somehow my life is empty. So uh, this is a tough time. You know, we're calling this uh, newsletter and warning. There, this is a time of blurred lines and broken boundaries and blinding lights. I mean, it's just everything is up for grabs right now, including yeah. minds and hearts. Well, Taylor, you got a last word for young people and parents that are dealing with young people as you begin to make your way to this new and exciting ministry you're going to? I do. I just for young people and parents of just this upcoming generation, uh, what a privilege it is to be able to get to be a part of just a generation that's coming up and to see what the Lord is going to do and is using them right now. And there's a lot to be heartbroken about. There's a lot to be sad about, but there's still a lot to be hopeful about. And the things that I admire about this upcoming generation of them craving truth and them wanting truth and them proclaiming and those that find it proclaiming it and fully wholeheartedly believing it you have a lot of passionate believers when someone in this generation comes to know the lord uh they from what i've seen and just experiencing middle schoolers and just who they are of uh when they truly come to know the lord it's it's a lot of passion and it's a lot of let's get it done and um, I think that's really exciting. And I'm just praying more and more for that just in this upcoming generation of just believers who are full in and not believers who are good at portraying and good at acting like they're, you know, someone. And then because um, I think this generation has seen a lot of church hurt and they've seen a lot of just um, over these past years, um, leaders who say they're one thing and then it turns out they're exactly another thing. And so I think that there's a lot to be said about this upcoming generation of who's been able to witness that and see that, that they're like, no, this is who I am. This is who the Lord has called me to be and I'm owning it and we're going to stick with it and run the race. And so that's just what I'm praying and that's what I'm hopeful for and I've already seen. So it's really exciting. Living the scriptures out loud. My wife, Diane, has a program. She's uh, been a huge part of and shepherding called uh, She Loves Out Loud. Uh, I do believe you got to live your faith out loud. I believe you got to share it out loud. You got to love out loud. 
you yeah. know, it says you got to love the Lord your God with all your, uh, with all your mind, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And uh, that's the greatest commandment. And the second commandment, which is just as important, Jesus said, literally said it in those words, is, and it has the same emphasis as the greatest commandment. I wrote it down here, Ted, you'll be fascinated. There are 1,130 commandments in the Bible. Wow. And Jesus summarized all of those commandments into two. Love the Lord your God with your heart, your soul, your strength, uh, your mind. Love it with everything you've got yeah. and love your neighbor as you love yourself. And that upon these two commandments, Jesus yeah hang all the other 1,130 commandments. So uh, this is serious stuff. So thank you for a strong word. And we're very grateful, Taylor, for you and your life. Uh, thanks, Dr. James.